Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Delta Airlines September Quarter 2023 Financial Results Conference Call. My name is Matthew, and I'll be your coordinator. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode until we conduct a question-and-answer session following the presentation. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, you may press star 1 on your phone to enter the question queue at any time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Julie Stewart, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Matthew. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Today uh, in Atlanta, we are joined by CEO Ed Bastian, our President Glenn Hallenstein, and our CFO Dan Janke. Ed will open the call with an overview of Delta's performance and strategy. Glenn will provide an update on the revenue environment, and Dan will discuss costs in our balance sheet. After the prepared remarks, we'll take analyst questions, and then we'll move to our media questions. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements that represent our beliefs or expectations about future events. All forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements. Some of the factors that may cause such differences are described in Delta's SEC filings. We'll also discuss non-GAAP financial measures, and all results exclude special items unless otherwise noted. You can find a reconciliation of our non-GAAP measures on the Investor Relations page at ir.delta.com. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Ed. Well, thank you, Julie, and good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us. Before we start, I want to acknowledge the unfolding war in Israel and the tragic loss of life that has ensued. Delta is donating $1 million to the American Red Cross for the International Committee of the Red Cross to help fund humanitarian efforts in the conflict. This includes emergency assistance such as health services, emergency care, ambulance services, and other critical needs. Our inbound and outbound flights to Tel Aviv have been suspended through October 31st to ensure the safety and security of our customers and employees. We're also offering a customer waiver for travel to Tel Aviv for those who need to change their travel plans. Our hearts with everyone impacted by these tragic and horrific events. Turning to our news for the day, this morning Delta reported September quarter results, posting earnings of $2.03 per share a 35% increase over last year. Revenue grew 13% and we achieved a 13.5% operating margin. This resulted in operating income of $2 billion, bringing our operating profit over the last 12 months to over $6 billion. The Delta people delivered for our customers throughout the very busy summer season, and I'm grateful to our teams for all they do for our customers and each other every day. Our people are the foundation of Delta and are our most important competitive strength. Sharing our financial success with our people is a long-standing pillar of Delta's culture. With this quarter's financial performance, we accrued another $420 million towards next February's profit sharing. This brings our profit sharing accrual to over $1 billion year to date, marking an important and exciting milestone for the Delta team. The great work of our 100,000 people was recently recognized as Delta ranked number 12 overall on Time Magazine's list of the world's best companies. We were the only airline to make the top 100 of this prestigious list. And USA Today readers just selected Delta as the best airline in the world. Our operational fundamentals remain strong, underscored by Delta's industry-leading position in on-time arrivals and blue sky operational performance that is reliably back to pre-COVID levels. Following a high number of irregular operations days early in the quarter driven by weather and ATC constraints, we have seen consistent improvement in our operating metrics. In October, we are running a near perfect completion factor across the mainline system, and we remain number one in on-time arrivals year to date. As we're now in the final phase of our recovery, we are making important forward-leaning investments in the health and reliability of our fleet. These maintenance investments will position us to consistently deliver the operational excellence that underpins Delta's brand. Running a high-quality operation is critical to being the airline of choice for our customers and, and driving a competitive cost structure. Dan will speak more to this shortly. During the quarter, we also made a $150 million strategic investment in Wheels Up, co-investing alongside Sertar's management, Knighthead Capital, and others. This new investment structure combines the number one premium commercial airline 
with the travel and tourism expertise of Taurus and the turnaround expertise of Nighthead. Delta's relationship with Wheels Up creates a new premium product line for our customers, and I look forward to working with our co-investors and the new management team to unlock the full value of this uniquely positioned business. Turning to our outlook, travel remains a top purchase priority, and our core customer base is in a healthy financial position. We continue to see strength in bookings across Delta's global network, driven by our consumers. Demand for premium experiences, international travel, and increasing business travel further differentiate the trends that Delta is seeing within the industry. We expect our December quarter revenues to be 10% higher than 2022, with a 10% operating margin and earnings of over $1 per share. This brings our expectation for full year earnings to over $6 per share on a double-digit operating margin and free cash flow of $2 billion. Since raising full-year guidance over the summer, our revenue outlook has improved, though earnings and cash flow have been impacted by higher fuel and maintenance costs. Revenue for the full year is expected to increase 20% over last year, which was the high end of our expectations on steady domestic demand and continued strength in international. With strong top-line growth and margin expansion, we expect to double earnings year-over-year and deliver a 13% return on invested capital. Our outlook for 2023 keeps revenue, earnings, cash flow, and debt reduction on track with our three-year plan, which we issued in December of 21. As we progress through the recovery, we have made meaningful investments in operational reliability and our people. Delta has led the industry in setting the bar for wages, including a new pilot deal and profit sharing. We are seeing the structural step up in operating costs amid increasing fuel prices, creating some near-term pressure on industry margins. However, I fully expect that the market will adjust to higher costs as it has historically and reestablish equilibrium. With Delta's differentiated premium revenue strategy and strong global network, we will continue to deliver industry-leading profitability and generate robust free cash flow. In closing, the strategy that we shared at Investor Day positions us well for the future. And while the the environment we operate in continues to evolve in this post-COVID world, our objectives are unchanged as we move into 2024. With our network rebuilt and growth now moderating, optimizing the airline and driving efficiency are significant opportunities. Thank you again for your support of our company. And with that, let me hand it over to Glenn and to Dan to go through the details of the quarter. Thank you, Ed, and good morning. I want to start by thanking all of our employees for their hard work and dedication during the busy summer travel season. In the September quarter, Delta generated revenue of $14.6 billion, up 13% over prior year. Total unit revenues were down 2.5%, including a point of pressure from cargo and MRO. With these results, I expect Delta to deliver a record September quarter unit revenue premium versus the industry, reflecting the continued success of our commercial strategy. Domestic passenger revenue was up 6% over prior year. Performance was steady through the quarter with strength in our coastal hubs where we are leveraging our leading positions and generational airport bills. International passenger revenue grew 35% with the transatlantic and Pacific outperforming our already high expectations. We delivered record margins across all international entities this summer and strength is continuing through the fall. Demand for our premium products is very strong with revenue up 17% over prior year outperforming main cabin by five points. Domestic paid load factor in our first class cabins was a record as we continue to advance our premium merchandising and upsell capabilities. Delta Premium Select has now been rolled out to over 85% of long haul flights and the revenue generation from this product has been above expectations and a key contributor to our record international margins. Business travel continues to steadily improve as corporates continue with return to office initiatives. Less recovered sectors like technology and financial services saw double-digit growth during the quarter. 
Our recent corporate survey indicates continued growth in business demand with a significant majority of companies expecting their travel to stay the same or increase as we move into 4Q and into 24. SME and hybrid travelers are producing margins in line with corporate travelers and demand from these travel remains well above 2019 levels. Total loyalty revenue was up 17% over prior year with continued strength in our American Express co-brand portfolio. Amex remuneration of 1.7 billion grew approximately 20% over prior year. We expect full year remuneration of close to 7 billion and are focused on reaching our long-term goal of 10 billion. Diversified revenue streams, including premium and loyalty, have generated 55% of revenue year-to-date, reflecting Delta's differentiated positioning to the industry. Turning to the December quarter, we expect total unit revenue to grow 9 to 12% over prior year, bringing our full year revenues to up 20% over prior year. This is at the high end of our guidance, even with a few points less capacity than we had planned for the year, reflecting robust demand for the Delta product. Capacity in the fourth quarter is expected to be up 14 to 15%, implying total unit revenues down 25 to 4.5% versus prior year. Domestic and transatlantic trends are expected to be consistent with the third quarter. Pacific and Latin America unit revenue trends are expected to be modest, excuse me, expected to modestly decelerate given capacity growth related to China reopening and investment in our LATAM JV. Domestic demand remains steady and initial bookings for the peak holiday periods are strong. The ongoing UAW and actor strikes are having a modest impact and we have incorporated those into our outlook. As we move through the fourth quarter, our domestic capacity growth moderates and in the first quarter of 2024, we expect domestic capacity to be flat to slightly down year over year. We have reallocated capacity to international leisure where we are expecting strong returns and remain focused on fully restoring our higher margin core hubs. On international, we are seeing continued demand strength through the winter. The transatlantic remains very strong, driven by partner hubs and southern European leisure traffic performance. We're closely monitoring the situation in Israel as we will evaluate restarting the flights as the situation stabilizes. In the Pacific, we expect to grow December quarter capacity 40 to 50 percent as we continue restoring the network. While this level of growth will impact unit revenue, we expect the new flying will be profit accretive. For the year, we remain confident in finishing strong with record profitability across all three international entities. In closing, I'm proud of the revenue performance that our teams have delivered, and I'm confident that our integrated commercial strategy will continue to drive industry-leading profitability. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan to talk about the financials. Thank you, Glenn, and good morning to everyone. For the September quarter, we delivered earnings of $2.03 per share, an operating margin of 13.5%. Non-fuel unit costs were up 1.3% year over year, and fuel prices averaged $2.78 a gallon, including a refinery benefit of 11 cents. We generated operating cash flow of 1.1 billion, and we invested, reinvested $1.4 billion into the business. Liquidity ended the quarter at $7.8 billion and adjusted net debt of $20.2 billion. Year to date, we've repaid $3.7 billion of gross debt. This is including $1.7 billion of accelerated repayments on our higher cost debt. Our leverage ratio improved to three times on a trailing 12-month basis. During the quarter, S&P upgraded our credit rating to double B plus, one notch away from investment grade, a recognition of our improving financial foundation. Our capital allocation priorities are reinvesting in the business and improving our balance sheet to investment grade metrics with a modest cash return to shareholders through our dividend. Now moving to guidance. For the December quarter, we expect non Fuel unit costs to be flat to up 2% on a year-over-year basis. With the exception of maintenance costs, our second half unit costs are progressing as expected. As we discussed in September, there are three drivers to higher maintenance. 
First, investment in fleet health. Second, expanded work scope on our 757 engine fleet. And third, challenges across the supply chain. On fleet health and reliability, our investments are starting to deliver improved operational performance. Our September metrics were ahead of August, and October is ahead of September. On the 757 engine, a workhorse in our fleet, we're going through a wave of overhauls. The engines we took off wing over the summer required larger work scope and a higher mix of new parts. Looking forward, we are forecasting higher new material consumption rates. On supply chain, the industry continues to face challenges that will take time to work through. Engine and airframe turnaround times remain elevated, driving inefficiency and impacting productivity. We are working closely with our partners and leveraging our deep expertise in tech ops to manage supply chain challenges. Delta has a long heritage of industry-leading operational performance driven by the best tech ops capability in the industry. Operational excellence is central to our brand promise and a key pacing item to drive out inefficiencies. Moving to fuel, fuel prices have moved higher since July, adding roughly $400 million of expense to our outlook for the second half of the year. We expect December fuel prices to be $2.90 to $3.20 per gallon, with the refinery expected to be roughly break-even for the quarter. The refinery turnaround is progressing as we planned, and we expect production to resume in mid-November. Based on our December quarter outlook for revenue and cost, we expect earnings of $1.05 to $1.30 per share on a 9 to 11 percent operating margin. This brings our full year outlook to earnings to $6 to $6.25 per share on double digit operating margin and free cash flow of $2 billion. We are focused on finishing the year strong, remain committed to delivering industry leading margin performance, earnings growth, and strong cash generation. As we progress through the 2024 planning process, our focus is shifting from restoration to optimization. Over the last two years, we've grown at an unprecedented rate for an airline of our size to restore our network. Growth is normalizing next year, and we expect operational reliability to continue to improve. This will allow us to optimize how we run the airline, reducing operational buffers and driving out inefficiencies that have resulted from the intensity of the rebuild. Our capacity growth for 2024 will be focused on Delta's areas of strength. Domestically, we are prioritizing our core high margin hubs, driving connectivity and gauge. Internationally, we are leveraging our best in class JV partnerships and increasing the mix of flying on next generation aircraft. We are executing against the strategy and financial objectives we laid out at our investor day with an emphasis on free cash flow, earnings durability, and capital efficiency. In closing, Delta is well positioned to maintain industry leadership operationally and financially. I'd like to sincerely thank the Delta people for everything they do every day. With that, I'll turn it back to Julie for Q&A. Thanks, Dan. Matthew, can you please remind the analysts how to queue up for a question? Certainly. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone at this time. We do ask that while posing your question, please pick up your handset if you're listening on speakerphone to provide optimum sound quality. We do ask that all Q&A participants please limit to one question and one follow-up question, then re-enter the queue. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone. Please hold while you poll for questions. Your first question is coming from Jamie Baker from J.P. Morgan. Your line is live. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, So, Dan, expanding on some of your engine comments, we're obviously focused on the GTF situation. Uh, I realize you're not or at least I don't believe you're directly impacted with any groundings right now. I'm just trying to square the situation against your MRO and your GTF in-house expertise. I mean, is there a scenario where the Pratt mess ends up 
benefiting Delta or, or should we think more about, you know, simply reducing the downside relative to some of your peers? Also, how does this impact the maintenance cost guide embedded in your 2024 CASM expectations? Thanks. Maybe first start with the gear turbo fan as it relates more directly to our fleet. Both on the NEO, we took our deliveries later, um, yep. so the impact will be modest to, to minimal. If there are any inspections or things off wing, it will be in the latter half of 2024 based on the analysis uh, that we've gotten so far from Pratt. Uh, we're, we're still waiting on the full analysis related to the 220 fleet. That should be coming later this month, and we will assess that impact uh, appropriately. As it relates to MRO, um, Pratt is certainly a a, part, a close partner of ours and an important one as it relates to that third-party capability. And we will certainly support their efforts. We're working closely with them on that. We have capacity. It ultimately comes down to the allocation of capacity and the availability of material to do the work. Um, but we'll be working with them through fall and into next year on that. Okay, that's helpful. And then for Glenn, you know, I've asked about this before. You know, a lot of Delta customers obviously took – you know, fairly lavish European vacations this year. You have Sky Miles data on these folks. What, what's the correlation between big summer spenders and big winter spenders? You know, what, what's that, I don't know, sort of Sky Miles Venn diagram look like? Because, you know, what I'm wondering about is the potential for people scaling back on their winter trips because, you know, they spent lavishly on their, you know, their summer holidays. Any actual data you can share on that? Thanks in advance. Sure. sure. I think uh, what we're really excited about is the lengthening of the European travel season. And that has really gone from primarily ending in the summer IATA season, which be, would be October, now through November, <clears throat> through the holidays, through the new year. And really now we're only talking about a six to eight week period that are, are the doldrums for Europe. So, the bookings, uh, which, which most people wouldn't have expected, of course, we reduce our, our schedule in the fall and the winter IATA season, but our uh, year-over-year comps are actually accelerating into the winter uh, as we as we look into November, December, and January. So I think we're seeing that continuing into the fall and early parts of winter, and we're very excited about that. And we've also, of course, expanded into a lot more Latin leisure this winter than we did last winter, and the advance demand for that seems very, very robust. So uh, leisure is still very strong, and even through uh, shoulder and off-peak periods. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Savi Sith from Raymond James. Your line is live. Hey, good morning. Um, if, if I may, on, uh, Glenn, just your comment about domestic capacity being flat to down in the first quarter, I, I'm just wondering if that was a decent trend for the full year or if it was related to also, uh, I know last year, the way first quarter kind of turned out wasn't what you expected and you were going to make some capacity changes. So is that related to, to that as well or is it more kind of weakness that you're seeing recently or, or maybe strength in, in the international on a relative basis? It's really a reshaping of the demand patterns that we saw last year. <clears throat> and uh, no shock, January and February are not in the northern tier transcons, the east-west markets, barn burner markets. So reallocating those to warmer and sunnier places. So our total capacity will be up. Domestic capacity will be down slightly. Core hubs will actually be up with more emphasis on warm and sunny places in Latin America and uh, and South Pacific. And uh, so that, that's kind of how we're profiling and really optimization of the demand patterns we saw last year going into this winter. That makes sense. And if I meant also on just on domestic, you know, revenue, you know, it's been stable uh, at Delta since kind of June. Um, I was wondering how much of a contribution you're getting from, you know, restoring your hubs and, and separately perhaps, you know, the domestic portion of international trips, given what you've talked about, the, the strength kind of continuing in transatlantic longer than, than kind of historic. Um, the reason I ask is it seems that stable comment is a little bit different than maybe what we're hearing from kind of the purely domestic airlines. Right, right. Um, I, I think what domestic strength is really coming from are the premium products domestically. 
and um, you know I'm, I'm not going to speak for the other carriers. They all have coming in the next few weeks, but it really hasn't been on domestic portion of international journey, which is de minimis in terms of the variance to what it was last year. Um, you know, our, our employments to the, in the transatlantic are up low double digits, but uh, that only represents 13% of our total travel, so really a, a de minimis impact to domestic. Uh, so it's really coming from the premium products, and they're doing quite well, as I mentioned. Uh, domestic first class, paid first class load factors uh, are reaching new heights every month. So. Uh, very excited about those demand trends, and uh, I think that reinforces the strategy we've been working on for the last 10 years to have a differentiated product. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Connor Cunningham from Melius Research. Your line is live. Hey everyone. Thank you. Um, Ed, in the uh, prepared remarks, I think you touched on, on fuel recapture. Um, you know, right now, there doesn't seem to be much of an adjustment on, on the capacity side from some of your industry participants, despite like erratic fuel. So just trying to, to understand that the, if there's a new calculus to how you're approaching fuel recapture right now uh, in, in the current market. Thank you. Well, um, you know, obviously fuel moved an awful lot uh, within just the last uh, couple of months. And it's the volatility of fuel that, that really you know, hits us hard as compared to the ability to recapture it. Uh, I think traditionally we've seen over a, a, a two to three quarter uh, rise. We have a pretty good success rate at, uh, at recapturing it. And when you think about the strength of the demand environment uh, and the fact that across the board, uh, everyone's not just fuel costs are up, but you know, labor rates are, are increasing and other inflationary pressure supply chain and maintenance costs are up. Everyone has a, a similar incentive to, uh, to continue to be able to recalibrate those pricing, that price, that those uh, market pressures into pricing. So, you know, my, my, uh, my outlook is I'm optimistic as we're going into 24. Glenn can, uh, can add his own, uh, his own color there. No, I think you uh, mentioned it really well. It takes time, and when we have rapid fuel price run-ups, it usually takes a few quarters for that to roll into the, in the industry uh, realized fares. But uh, historically, it's it's always uh, it's always worked. So, you know, we're looking at history to predict the future, but that uh, that's what the history would tell you. <laughs> okay, appreciate that. And then, uh, Dan, just back to the, the to the maintenance costs and operational investments. Just trying to understand. I know you touched on it in Jamie's question, but just trying to understand how how it plays out. Is are you basically assuming that maintenance and operational investments will be elevated in the first half, and then how does that roll off? And then when do the productivity gains that you've talked about in the past kind of kick in? I'm just trying to understand how that all, the moving parts are are changing a little bit right now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, certainly talk about it. We're in the we're in the middle of Connor. Thank you. We're in the middle of the 24 planning process. Uh, you think about. Maintenance, uh, as Ed talked about, it, it is a foundational item uh, as it relates to our operational reliability and the, th the investments that we're making here were related to fleet health and the work that we're doing on our engines. We're going to stay after here, and that will be with us uh, at least into the first half of next year, and uh, we want to drive that operational reliability. The second part of that is as you get that operational reliability, that is really what creates the foundation to be able to start to optimize and unlock the cost uh, investment and inefficiencies that we talked back about at Investor Day, that billion dollars plus. And uh, as you see that operational reliability continue to improve, our teams will be able to lean more and more into, into getting those investment buffers out, those inefficiencies that are in every part of our operation. Uh, and our teams are working through that as they're building out their operating plan and financial plan for 2024. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Dwayne Finningworth from Evercore ISI. Your line is live. Hey, hey good morning. Uh, just on the maintenance investment, I'll follow up to, to maybe Jamie's question there. Um, is this at all a reflection of, um, you know, your thoughts on future aircraft delivery constraints? In, in other words, were you always thinking about using those 7.5s next year? Um, and then just generally, how do you think about and measure uh, returns on capital for investing in something like a 757 versus, you know, going out and buying new? Yeah. And Glenn can chime in here, too. 
you know, I think the 757 has been a fleet as we've gone through our restoration that we've, we've characterized as a flexible fleet. And it's one that uh, it's certainly a workhorse. Um, the returns are very good related to how we deploy it and, and fly it within our network. So we have leaned on it. You know, when you think back of where we might have been 18, 24 months ago, the number that we were flying, we have reactivated more as we continue to see new delivery slide and we get recalibrated year to year. So it is one that we've leaned into. And um, it's one that we will, you know, we'll be flexible on as we work through the next three, four, five years in regards to how we deploy it. Uh, the wave of overhauls that we started last year and we're doing this year, we'll have more same next year, but that gets us through a heavy wave that then allows us really very viable engines that, uh, you know, the Delta team has always been very good at managing the end of, end of life of an asset. We did it on the uh, 90s, 88s in regards to how you manage that those, those assets and deploy them, but also get the most out of them, uh, whether it's in whole or in the parts and how they're redeployed back in the stream. And we are always working closely then with fleet and maintenance with Glenn's team on how to deploy them and get the best returns for them. But those are good returning. Uh, it's a great workhorse for our fleet with good good returns. Nothing to add other than, yeah, we, we took a lot of late deliveries. I think our last 7.5 was produced. Uh, we had the last one ever built. So some of these planes are not that old, and, and we had them in our fleet, and we have. But as you said, as we get to the end of life of these towards the end of this decade, we'll be able to really start harvesting the engines, which will really improve the maintenance profile of the fleet. And Dwayne, uh, this is Ed, if I could add my perspective. You know, your, your point is right. It is related to the OEMs fundamentally. Their inability to produce uh, engines uh, on time, which, you know, they're having you know, their own challenges within the supply chain, as well as parts uh, on time. And the one thing that has been a core part of Delta Strength over at Tech Ops is our ability to uh, go into the, the used uh, repair market and acquire assets and, and repurpose them uh, towards our own needs. Uh, that market has largely dried up given all the, the large rebound in flight activity, which uh, was, got, was uh, uh, running at the same time the OEMs have been having and struggling to produce new. So I think this is something you're going to see across the industry. This isn't just at Delta. Um, and it's one of the constraints we talked about at Investor Day. It's going to keep us all pretty limited in the amount of capacity that we uh, we can produce. Uh, but I put my uh, my money on the Delta Tech Ops team because they're the best in the business and we'll figure this out. And we know this is a, while, while it may hit the expense line, uh, we know this is a long-term asset that's going to pay dividends for years to come. Appreciate those thoughts, and maybe maybe just for my follow up on uh, on Pacific and and Glenn, can you just remind us where we are in China reopen? I think there's another you know round of expansion here in November, and then just broadly in Pacific, you know, what are the markets away from uh, China that you're you're excited about? Well, I think what we're very excited about is the success of our Incheon hub with Korean, and uh, that has really even exceeded our expectations. We think it's the best place to connect to get to Southeast Asia from any one of our hubs or, or as a double connect. So uh, really trying to leverage that, and we'll have some announcements on continuing to work to increase our capacity next year. But that's really been a linchpin. Uh, South Pacific has been a, a really great uh, surprise for us. The, the demand there, uh, really in tune with that same high demand for leisure destinations. Uh, so uh, that's been doing very well, as well as Japan. As you know, Japan was closed for a couple of years, and our, our Japanese franchise is doing quite well. So you put the Pacific together, and uh, if you recall, for years we were telling our investors to hold on. We've got this restructuring coming. We had the wrong airplanes. We were at the wrong airports. And it took us many years to get to where we wanted to be, but uh, we're finally there, and, and we're producing great returns in the Pacific, and we're excited about our opportunities moving forward. I appreciate the detailed thoughts. Oh, China. I didn't say uh, China, of course. Uh, we went from essentially uh, double daily in Detroit, uh, double weekly, I'm sorry, in Detroit and Seattle to 10x a week, with Seattle moving to daily and Detroit moving to uh, uh, 3x. So, uh, and we'll see if there's another wave of this. I think the first thing we have to see is uh, is there demand for the capacity that's going into market right now, and we'll uh, we'll 
keep you abreast of that as we move forward on, on China reopening. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Andrew Tadora from Bank of America. Your line is live. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Ed, a couple of questions, just kind of want to bring it back to some things discussed at Investor Day. I guess maybe first, um, just on capacity growth, I, I know you gave us a little color about how you're thinking about 1Q, kind of domestic versus international, but the mid-single-digit growth that you talked about in, in 2024, I guess in this fuel environment, you know, would you consider that growth rate as reasonable or aspirational at this point in time? Well, I, it's probably more a question for Glenn uh, than myself, but at my level, as I just said in my last comments, I hear I, my sense would be any capacity that you uh, you hear from us in terms of plants or the industry, you should read as somewhat aspirational because there still are tremendous constraints in the marketplace in terms of delivering that growth. Um, you know, if all goes well and we get all the parts and we get the planes on time and we have the labor ready and ATC is not an issue and fuel prices stay reasonable, yeah, that's what's going to happen. Uh, but if you look over the last two to three years, uh, we continue to evolve it. So those, those are just uh, points in time estimates as to what we could do, as to what we actually will be able to do. I think we'll probably across the board be a little less than that. And, and I would just add a comment. About half of that is run rate of what's in there as we enter the first quarter of next year. So, uh, you know, the real number is half of low single digits, which is very low single digits. Yep. Got it. Makes sense. And then, I guess, Dan, just on CASA and CASM next year, obviously, you know, with capacity moving around, obviously the, the maintenance, maintenance costs continuing into next year. Can I just give us a sense of your level of confidence in 2024 CASMX being able to be down kind of low single digits, or should we think about that differently as well? Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, we're still in the middle of our, our planning process. Uh, so all these pieces are coming together, right? Uh, capacity, along with all the things that we've talked about regarding the maintenance, we're spending certainly a lot more time on that, given all the moving pieces uh, in the industry and elements that we talked about. Yeah, Dan's comments earlier about this is going to be a pivot to optimization is a big deal, and maintenance is a part of that. Maintenance unlocks uh, the ability yeah. to drive the efficiencies across the enterprise. and. We're right in the middle of the planning process, so we're not trying to dodge the question, but you know, we will give you uh, at the, the typical time at the start of the year what we think we can do. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Catherine O'Brien from Goldman Sachs. Your line is live. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the time. Um, Ed, on, on CNBC this morning, you called out a pickup in corporate bookings. Could, could we just dig into that a little bit more? You know, What have sure. you seen since since Labor Day on volumes or, or revenue from corporate, you know, any industries or regions that are bigger drivers, which really across the board, and, and, and anything on maybe just, you know, corporate booking windows um, um, today versus maybe a couple months ago, and they're still longer than pre-COVID. Appreciate it. Well, we, we, we said on the last call that we anticipated post-Labor Day that we'd see volumes of corporate travel pick up, and indeed we're seeing that. I think Len mentioned a couple of sectors, the tech sector and the, the financial services sector is areas that we're, we're seeing uh, double-digit growth. Uh, we have, uh, I'd say across the board, uh, we're, we're seeing increases. And, you know, it's, it's you know, corporate travel as it's come back, it's, it comes back and then plateaus come back and plateaus. And I think you'll see another, another wave of, of return. Uh, I think a lot of it's being driven by the return to office and getting into the new normal uh, work patterns, uh, which many companies are still sorting out for themselves. But it, it's healthy to see, and it's one of the distinguishing factors between us and uh, and some of the carriers that are on the other end of the fare spectrum. So uh, one of the many differentiating factors that, that, that are, is enabling us to grow revenues at the pace we are. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks so much. And then one, maybe, maybe this is for Dan. Can you just speak to how the air traffic liability is trending year to date and, and into the fourth fourth quarter versus your expectations at the start of the year? I know we kicked off the year with really strong first quarter performance on that ETL build. Um, should you be aware of any impact from you know normalization of booking windows um, versus last year, just given the the pickup in corporate volume you're seeing? Thanks a lot. No, I'd say it's performing as we expected. 
You know, we're starting to maybe get back to a little bit more of the traditional seasonality. Uh, as we were restoring, it was a little bit different. And uh, if you look at historical patterns, you're only down mid-teens as you go through into the fourth quarter. And that's kind of what we saw as we wrapped up um, the, the third quarter here. And um, so, no, the other element that you have in there is you certainly have we've had very friendly policies as it relates to credits and customers have gotten really used to using them. And we think that's all obviously long-term beneficial that people have confidence to book and, and travel, but also consume when they don't travel. And, uh, you know, those, those we've seen very consistent uh, issuance and usage rates on them. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Mike Lindenberg from Deutsche Bank. Your line is live. Oh, yeah. Hey, um, good morning, everyone. Glenn, you, you called out um, a couple sectors that were underperforming from a corporate perspective. I mean, I think of any carrier, probably the most indexed to the automotive sector and then sort of the media sector with the writers and actors uh, strike. What what sort of drag do you actually think that had on, on your corporates, at least in, you know, the month of September and maybe what you're seeing right now? Well, clearly, I'll start with Los Angeles and the entertainment production strikes that are ongoing. Um, that has had a, a not insignificant change in the business travel to and from Los Angeles, mm-hmm. uh, and as well as now the UAW strike, which has curtailed a significant amount of the business in Detroit. As you point out, we're very big in both of those sectors. And what I'm really encouraged about is despite those two kind of being things that we should look forward to as positives next year, uh, that our total corporate revenues are still accelerating. So just despite those two being a drag on them, and I think hopefully those are both resolved uh, fairly quickly here and we can get back to a normal business level, but you are right spot on that we are probably the most impacted by those two sectors. Great. And then just a quick one to Dan or Ed. Um, I didn't see in the release a reiteration of the $7 plus for 2024. I know you're still mid-budget, but just based on the trajectory and everything you're seeing now, that number's still fine? That's our that's our plan, Mike. As I, I mentioned, that uh, you know, we gave that, uh, that, that guide in uh, December of 2021, mm-hmm. uh, as long as free cash and others, and uh, we're on track. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Ravi Shanker from Morgan Stanley. Your line is live. Uh, thanks. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, Glenn, if I'm probably going to ask Jamie's initial SkyMiles data mining question in a different way. Kind of based on data that you have, do you have any evidence that traditional domestic travelers have been flying internationally more often in 2023? And maybe people taking their first or kind of rare international trips, just trying to see if there's any truth or, or data to back up the thesis that there has been substitution of domestic with people flying internationally this year. Well, I, I'd say that's a, a very broad question, and clearly there's been an expansion of international, but if you think about domestic uh, and the volume differential between the number of seats we have every day domestically and the number of seats we have every day to Europe, it would be very hard to track those incremental visits back to people who did not fly domestically because it's such a small piece of domestic travel in terms of total volumes. And so uh, while clearly there, the spend has been very robust for long haul in general, we have not seen a diminishing of short haul leisure. Got it. That's really helpful. Uh, and maybe to follow up, kind of, you know, feels like Trans-Pacific has not quite been the explosion uh, of pent-up demand that we saw in domestic and transatlantic when they initially opened. But uh, it looks like 2024 might be a better year for that. Is there any way you think that the historical profitability in in that region, which has not been great to say the least, uh, can be better uh, when that initial kind of flow through of demand comes through with with pricing the way it might potentially be? Well, I I'd, uh, disagree with you on your premise there that uh, Pacific has been a laggard. Uh, Pacific has been quite robust, and I think we indicated these are our record profits in terms of margins and total profitability in the Pacific. And if you look at the Pacific, absent of China, it's it's been fully restored. So uh, I think we're very pleased with the demand to the Pacific, and we're uh, we're 
right now, you know, that, that's where our capacity is sitting up most in the fourth quarter and where it will be in the first and through next year. And so, and we're very enthusiastic about the results we're getting there. Very helpful. Thanks, Len. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Brandon Oglinski from Barclays. Your line is live. Yeah, good morning, and thanks for taking my question. Uh, Glenn, I know you've called out, uh, you know, your corporate travel here being up and coastal hub strength, but can you talk to maybe any areas of weakness domestically, and is there, like, diverging trends with your main cabin revenue? Well, I think, yeah, we've called out diverging trends with main, main cabin. Those have been pretty consistent, though, uh, throughout the recovery is, is it's been led by premium products and services. So that's not – inconsistent between quarters. I think it's actually relatively flat in terms of this, of the uh, uh, how, how much premium is driving there. And uh, geographically, I think uh, what we're really excited about is the coastal hub investments we've made, and particularly New York. That's something we're looking for in 24. We've, uh, we see a lot of momentum in the Northeast and New York in particular as things to look forward to in 24. Okay, and then on the outlook for next year, you know, growing with your JVs on the international side, how does the changes uh, in Mexico impact this as they move to a Category 1 with the FAA? Right. Mexico has been a, a great uh, source of strength for us uh, through the last year, and we see continued strength in those Mexican business. And I, I think when you think about what we read in the press and what you all see in the onshoring and moving factories from Asia down into Mexico, we've seen really a, an incredible strength in demand from uh, the business sector in Mexico, and, and that's looking really robust into 2024. And uh, working with Aeromexico now, you know, we really couldn't do much with them. These are things we wanted to do in the past. So you see us coordinating with them. We, we have a ATI joint venture, so we've been working very closely with them to uh, continue to work on where we see strength and being able to serve those markets better, including uh, the, the auto sector in Detroit and including Atlanta as a primary gateway to Mexico primary and secondary airports. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Helen Becker from TD Cowan. Your line is live. Oh, thanks very much, operator. Hi, everybody, and thank you very much for the question. Just um, on... Um, with 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 respect to as you think about um travel next summer on the north atlantic especially where us citizens are going to need visas H how are you thinking about communicating that to to people as they book trips um is that going to be in the reservation process or follow ups or you know how do you avoid surprises uh, Helene, hi. It's Peter Carter. Um, say we we will uh, we will make sure our customers are aware of the visa requirement at various points along the purchasing path and the journey. And I will tell you that the nice thing about the the, the new visa requirement is it is an e visa, so it's a fairly straightforward process that we think will take about 24 hours. Yeah, I think it's like Australia, right, where it's pretty quick unless it's not. Um, I think, um, okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And then the other question I had was just um, on on the changes to, to Israel. How, how big, actually, is that in your total, in, in the total market? It's a lot of ASMs, but it can't be that big in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, exposure. It's a little over a point of ASMs, and um, yeah, we're not going to give an exact number, but it's included. In, uh, the revenue hit is included in our fourth quarter guide, so we've uh, we've extended at least through uh, October, and then we'll see what happens. Uh, the reason we're not saying how much exposure there is is we don't know how this will evolve yet. So we're we're staying very fluid, but I think we feel very confident that we can get inside of our, our guidance ranges here with Israel kind of in a worst-case scenario. Got it. Okay. Thanks very much. Matthew, we'll now go to our final analyst question. Certainly. Your last question is coming from Sheila Kayoklu from Jeffries. Your line is live. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Um, Ed, I wanted to ask you a question. You made a comment about your leading into the cost curve and really leading the industry here with pilot pay and the like. So, 
the question comes, you know, how do we think about your double digit margins today versus low cost carriers and what they'll report in Q3 and margin moving pieces maybe into 2024 if you want to provide that or maybe the Delta versus Delta and other carriers? Hi, right, Sheila, you should look at our 24 guide that we gave you with our three year plan. The, the good news of Delta is that we have all of our labor costs you know, at the new market across the board today in posting those double digit margins. So to the extent other carriers need to be increasing their labor costs uh, in future negotiations, uh, they're just going to be chasing uh, chasing the Delta cost. And I think that conversions of uh, industry rates is something we've, we've talked about as you know, kind of another another opportunity as we, as we look at trying to make sure we're all running a better business here and we're not uh, we have the same incentives to make sure that our costs are finding their way into our pricing. Sure. No, it makes sense. Um, and if I could ask one more, a lot on Delta Tech Ops, um, you know, obviously a big asset for Delta right now. Anything you could talk about? I think you have previously said GTF shop visits are running at 670 to 80 engines. I don't know if that was only GTF or all engines ramping to potentially 400. Maybe if you could just give us the oppor- uh, talk about the opportunity longer term with Delta Tech Ops and what utilization is. Yes, uh, talk about it. A baseline this year, uh, Tech Ops for geared turbofan engine overhauls would be in the 150, 160 range. Uh, we have built capacity to take that to, to three up to 350 and continue to discuss uh, long-term, medium and longer-term capacity needs with with Pratt related to that. Um, so we talked about it in Investor Day, I'm very optimistic about our position. Well, not only the, the heritage that we have and the great expertise that we have in the Delta Tech Ops team, but our positioning as it relates to being on all the key next generation platforms, whether that's Gear Topofan, whether that's Rolls, and also uh, the Leap Engine, uh, create a real set of opportunities for us as we think about this business and multiples of what it can be today over the medium and long term. Thank you so much. That will wrap the analyst portion of the call. I'll now turn it over to Tim Mapes to start the media questions. Thank you, Julie. Matthew, if we could, as we transition from the analyst questions to those from the members of the media, um, maybe repeat the instructions for everyone, please. Certainly. At this time, we'll be conducting a Q&A session for media questions. If you have any questions or comments, please press star, then one on your phone. Please hold while we poll for questions. Your first question is coming from Don Gilbertson from Wall Street Journal. Your line is live. Hi. uh, Good morning. Um, Ed, I wonder if you could give us any more color, Ed or Glenn, on the uh, reaction to the Sky Miles changes and when you expect to, you know, announce the things you might be rolling back or changing? Uh, hi, Dawn. Uh, we, uh, you know, we've I've mentioned uh, publicly over the last couple of weeks that we're certainly receiving uh, good feedback from our customers with respect to the changes. I have indicated that we uh, had too many uh, changes uh, rolled out at the same time, and we needed to go back and reassess uh, the, uh, the planned uh, planned rollout for the new qualification levels. Uh, and I mentioned this uh, this morning on the CNBC interview. There's two things, though, that, that are common throughout all of the feedback. One is there is the intense loyalty to Delta, which is really heartwarming to see. Uh, the loyalty to this brand is great. We've worked hard to build it, and we maintain that. We will continue to maintain that. There's, there should be no question about that. And secondly, that uh, most everyone also agrees that something has to be done because everyone sees that the premium number of customers that we continue to build are in excess of the premium assets that we have to offer. And so figuring out how to better rationalize and make certain that the service levels for our premium customers are where they need to be is, you know, there's various ways to get it. Uh, we've received a lot of ideas as to different ways to think about it, and you'll be hearing from us in the coming days. Okay, if I could just have one quick follow-up on, on that front. What is driving, in terms of the reaction, I mean, are you seeing just feedback, or are you seeing an impact on credit card uh, signups and or cancellations? I mean, what's driving this pretty quick uh, change to your initial plans? 
Well, it's it's the feedback. It's not the no. We're not seeing any any change in trajectory, rather on acquisitions or changes in spend levels. Everything continues to stay intact, as Glenn I think mentioned during some of his comments. Uh, this is good feedback that we're we're seeing, and uh, and candidly, with some of it, I I agree with him. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Allison Sider from Wall Street Journal. Your line is live. Hey, uh, thanks so much. Um, so there's been some um, analysis recently about sort of the potential impact of you know, cost savings if people really started taking uh, weight loss drugs like Ozempic in big numbers. Is that something you look at at all? Like, do you factor that into your fuel projections or, or anything like that? Uh, no, we don't, uh, Ali. And then, if I could follow up, um, I was also curious on, on um, potential Israel evacuation flights. Um, I know there's ongoing discussions with the government on this, but you know, would, would Delta be open to flying to Israel under a charter you know, if the government asked or if there was a craft, act, craft activation, or would you rather you know, just fly the, to points outside of Israel? You know, is, there, is there any openness, I guess, to flying kind of under those circumstances? There, there, there are discussions, as, as I've indicated. Uh, right now, we're looking at uh, providing some additional lift to Europe to get people out of Europe. But no, we don't have any plans to uh, to be flying into into Israel. Uh, it's considered unsafe for a U.S. carrier to operate uh, in in that airspace currently. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Mary Schlangenstein from Bloomberg News. Your line is live. Hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to ask real quickly, with the ongoing um, slot waiver situation in New York where the airlines were asked to reduce capacity because of the congestion and the air traffic controller shortage, can you talk about um, how much of that Delta is taking advantage of and whether you expect that, if it continues long term, to start to have some significant impact? Also, whether you're redeploying that capacity into other markets? Well, thanks for that question. Yes, we're planning on using the uh, entirety of the slot waiver, which is, I believe, 10% of our flights into and out of Kennedy and LaGuardia, in order to help with the airspace congestion issues that are surrounding those airports right now. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to do is have minimal impact. We will not withdraw from any individual markets. We will thin out some frequencies. We'll put some larger gauge in. And this, any of the assets that are freed up from New York will get redeployed into other parts of our network for now. But uh, it shouldn't really be very different than the summer. As you know, that's rolled forward from the summer, which we had 10% out, and that's just extending it through the winter. So you won't see really, I think, any dramatic changes to our schedule uh, versus where we're sitting today. Does that become a broader problem for you if that continues to be extended? I think the broader problem is not being able to operate in the New York airspace. and so. I think we're working very closely with the government to see what we can do to improve the situation there. It was very uh, very difficult on our customers this summer, and certainly we're all hoping for for some relief by next summer. And Mary, we really, this is Peter Carter, we really appreciate the FAA providing that relief and acknowledging that there is a constraint in the Northeast with respect to the staffing of air traffic controllers. and. You know, frankly, that's the thing that, that we need to really solve as an industry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Leslie Joseph from CNBC. Your line is live. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, we keep seeing airfares fall, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what kind of discounting you're having to do uh, in the fall, and then have you made any capacity changes on days when people might have traveled in the off-peak, and, and maybe they're going back to more traditional uh, bookings, if that's the case. Thanks. Sure. I think the most recent data that came out this morning had them flat to up slightly month over month, so I don't think that uh, as an industry level that's a good indication. What we've seen is that actually June was our lowest point in terms of year-over-year -year average fares, and it's moved up for us since then, and that's really driven by the premium side and uh, the success we've had in terms of selling more premium and the fares we're getting for our premium products and services. So, yes, at the bottom end, there's some discounting. Uh, there's also some fair initiatives. So it's it's always a very fluid situation. And uh, right now, I think we're very we're calling it stable between third quarter and fourth quarter. And the um, 
the fares that you're discounting too, or is that like on par with 2019, or is that like is there kind of a reference point for? Yeah, I, I, certain markets are, certain markets are above. So I think the market basket is there at the very bottom end. They may be slightly below uh, where they were in 19, but no, not really. Uh, there's always a, a fare in a market that is below, but uh, in general, they're not. Thanks. Thank you, Leslie. Matthew, we have time for one final question, please. Certainly. Your last question is coming from David Slotnick from TPG. Your line is live. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for taking the question. Um, going back to the loyalty program, were you surprised by the customer reaction and I suppose the degree of it? And you know, what were you sort of expecting instead of that? If that... Uh, we were certainly expecting uh, some uh, some feedback, uh, and by the way, some of the feedback we we've received is very positive and uh, encourages us not to ch make any changes. So uh, there wasn't any one uh, uh, cohort that was was silent on the matter. We heard we heard all you know, a full 360 view of the the perspective, but it gave us a chance to sit back, reflect on it, and there were points about the uh, the program that I thought there were that we could make some modifications to. Uh, there still will be changes to the program. I, I, I've been very clear about that, but we're going to make modifications to what we announced. Thank you. And, and just to follow up, was American Express expecting any changes to the premium card demand just with the lounge access? Do they think that that's potentially going to fall? And if so, will that impact your loyalty revenue? Uh, American Express, uh, we, we of course did this with full back and forth knowledge, so we did this together with American Express. And uh, if anything, we, since we've announced it, we've seen a shift to higher premium card acquisitions. So uh, I think we're, we're well within, from, the, from that perspective, where we thought we'd be. Great, thank you. Thank you, David. And Matthew, I think that will conclude our, our call.